Shabbat Shalom Yasharala. This is intro to the Torah. Regardless if you've been in the, the Torah a year, two years, three years, or a day, this video can and may help you most definitely because just because you've been in it doesn't mean you've been taught properly and um, come to full understanding on certain topics because we're going to hit a variety of things. I'm going to uh, give uh, some breakdowns on study tools at the very end of this study. We're going to even go over the Ten Commandments. A lot of people, uh, just because you're in Torah doesn't mean you've gone in depths of understanding every commandment and, uh, you know, the breakdown and so on. But before we continue, let's blow the trumpet, the shofar on his feast days, number 10, numbers 1010. 10. And if you read numbers 1010 10 in the Targum, it says that it strikes fear into Hasatan and his minions. So all together, Yasharala, if you have a shofar, um, if you don't, just give a shout of praise all together on his day. All right. All right. Good day. It's a blessed day to be here and to uh, be able to fellowship with everyone on his feast day, a.k.a. Shabbat. So before we get into the study of intro to the Torah, let's pray and ask for guidance and protection. All together, Yasharala. <clears throat> Heavenly Abba, Haya in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We ask that you protect this line of fellowship, Heavenly Father, that you continue to guide us through your Ruach Kodesh and that you push away anything that's not from you. And you give us the spirit to be humbled and to be strengthened, to do your will and only your will, especially in these last days, Heavenly Father. Please give us everything we need to endure till the end and to become a servant of our creator and a follower and um, of our Mashiach. And in his name, amen. Can I get an amen, Yasharala? And y'all know I got my classic glass of red wine. Can't go wrong. All right. Um, I had a sister reach out to me. I, I, I know I had another study posted, but sister reached out to me and said, if there's somebody new, what YouTube video could I send them? And man, I, I totally was like, oh my goodness, I don't have a video on YouTube for people that are just getting into it. And I haven't broke down the, the basics of the Torah, even to, like I said, people that even been in it for two years. And because you'll see, you'll see in this study that it doesn't matter how long you've been in it because the, a lot of the popular things that you can, that you can, you will Google is wrong because it's man's tradition. And if you, um, believe you're a Torah keeper, there is a whole nother Torah out there. That's traditions of man, which is called Judaism. Judaism is Torah and Talmud intertwined, which means it becomes a whole new religion. People, a lot of people leave uh, churchianity, any type of religion in the church, and then they go right into Judaism. That's the whole reason why Judaism is there. To, uh, for people that is looking for truth, to lead them astray. And so a lot of people that's in Torah technically is in Talmud, Judaism. You're not in Torah because Torah is the most highest commandments with no leaven, no man's traditions. If you're in Judaism, you're actually not in Torah. It's a thing that a lot of people don't understand in this walk. There is levels to this. So now this video right here is for you, regardless of how long you've been in the Torah, so we can fact check everything that we're doing right now. And for beginners that this is your first day, so you do not 
fall into deception of religion and man's traditions. All right. So I'm about to share screen and let's get it on. Over here. Okay, here we go. Here we go. All right. Intro to the Torah. Before we get started, you'll see, I, 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 this is especially for people that are just getting into Torah. You're going to run into a lot of Hebrew terminology. I'm not going to use a lot in this, but I'm, I'm uh, helping for you to brace for impact when you get so many people in these communities um, and, and this is not to be limited to this either. There's a lot more terminology, but I'm just putting this here so you have basic understanding. So if you want to take a screenshot um, or you can hit me up, I can send you this later. But when I use the name ha Ahaya or Haya, I am actually talking about God the Father because God is in a name. is actually more pagan than even a title. And that's another thing in this walk that we got to start uh, doing is that we got to get out of this, all these uh, spiritual pagan terminology. So we see uh, Ahaya, we actually want to use the names. We don't want to use titles. We don't want to use Lord. We don't want to use God. Call on his name or at least call him Father Abba. That's better than calling him God personally. Um, and um, and uh, Ahaya means he who exists, the existed he who always has existed. And then um, me personally, I'm not going to get into the names in this study. I um, actually have my YouTube open for a reason. Let me see. Oops. One. Oh, my goodness. I'll show that later. I'll come back. But um, I'll show the YouTube, all my YouTube videos. I have YouTube videos of quite a few things right now and things that I'm working up to. So I'm not going to go over all of this, but this is just, just a little extra information for those that don't know. When I say, like in the beginning, I would say, Yasharala, that's Israel, the Hebrew name for Israel. So things like that. The Ruach, Kodesh, is the Holy Spirit. People hear Shabbat. What is Shabbat? I have someone ask me the other day, what is Shabbat? That is Sabbath in Hebrew. Shabbat Shalom is peaceful greetings on the Sabbath, like have a peaceful Sabbath. Or uh, or you if you just say, if it's not the Sabbath, if you just say Shalom or Shalom, that means just a peaceful greeting of a goodbye or a hello. Uh, amen, when you end your prayers, Amen is it, uh, actually pronunciation is not correct. It's more like Amen which is Hebrew, the actual Hebrew pronunciation for that word, because it is a Hebrew word. So let's pronounce it in Hebrew and uh, so on. This recording will be, uh, this will, this will be uploaded on YouTube right after this study. I'm going to do it um, this evening. All right. The Torah includes the first five books of the Hebrew Bible written by Moses, namely Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But the Torah, the word Torah in Hebrew can mean teaching, direction, guidance, and law. And this is very important because the Torah is not limited to the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. You can get instructions or, in, or directions from the entire Bible or, and or scripture. And I say scripture, we'll get into the Apocrypha at the end of this study. So you can get Torah anywhere in scripture, but the base of understanding always goes back to the first five because this is the first five books where all the instructions was written out verbatim. 
And if you actually read the tour line for line, it is very straightforward and it covers a wide variety of things that you would be surprised about. So Torah isn't limited to the first five, but this is the base foundation of instructions in all scripture. Most things that most, because most uh, prophets, uh, apostles, they are quoting from the first five books when they are talking about instructions. Continuing, so Jubilee, that's an apocryphal book, and there's reasons why they took these books. Well, they didn't take them out. They never was in the Bible. A lot of people say they took them out the Bible. They never was in the Bible because the Bible was constructed by man to limit our understanding. Let me say that again. Let me pause this. The Bible was constructed by man to limit our understanding. So many people go, why was it in the Bible? Who even constructed the Bible? The Bible, the word Bible isn't even in the Bible. There's no prophecy of the Bible, of people even putting together the Bible. He didn't say, I will have men construct you a book and you do not go outside this book. The Bible was constructed to control our minds and build a religion around spiritual writing that has power. The entire world uses the Bible. I have studied people that is mathematicians that that does that study shapes with sacred geometry. I have looked into people with the that's in the occult, Freemasonry. It doesn't matter witchcraft. Every single group on the face of the earth uses this spiritual writing because it's powerful. If y'all have watched the book of Eli, the movie of the that's uh that's called the book of Eli, that, that is a prime example. Denzel Washington is trying to hold on to the last Bible, and a man is trying to steal it because he knows it's powerful, but he's using it for evil. Just like the slave masters did in, uh, to the slave trade in America, and just like the Pope did with uh, religion from Catholicism to Christianity and all the different denominations of uh, Christianity. They have constructed a book with limited understanding, especially with the teachers, that the way they teach it, to mold our minds to keep us limited to maximize our spiritual abilities, which is the foundation of Torah, Yasharala. Stop, get out of your own mind about the Bible being something sent by the Most High. The Bible sent all scripture, which like I said, we will elaborate on the end with the Apocrypha, but do not think the way the Bible's constructed was meant to be perfect. It's not even written in the Bible that he was going to give us a perfect book to not go outside of. Just want to make that crystal clear. All right, let's get back on the show. <laughs> that's because that's one of the biggest uh, block that people have. I don't know, it's, they, but they can't even tell me who constructed the Bible. Is it some prophet, apostle? No, it's some random uh, pagans, some random pagans that constructed the Bible, but you're you're going all in with that. All right. So that being said, Jubilees 2326, in, and in those days, the children shall begin to study the Torah, the instructions to the way of life, and to keep the commandments, and to return to the path of righteousness. So right here in one verse, the path of righteousness is synonymous with keeping the Torah. And uh, Joseph uh, 1, 8. This book of the law, which uh, anytime you see law, this is actually Torah in Hebrew. And I'm going to show you this also in the uh, back end of this study. The, this book of law or Torah shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou may have observed to do according to all that is written therein. And for then thou shalt make thy ways prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. So we got Apocrypha right here. I got Old Testament. So you know I had to go into New Testament to keep that same energy. 
So I can show you that the New Testament is not a separate book. This is all one book, family. I've seen some good videos that, that shows how they, they separate the books by putting New Testament and Old Testament. Or if you have a book that has an Apocrypha, they have Apocrypha. Rip out those pages. It's one book. Or it's, a, or it's a one big book of different books that is the same story. First John chapter 2, 3, 4. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Sounds very similar, right? All of these are saying the same thing because it's the same story, same directions. Just different writers, different times. He that says, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Very straightforward. In Ecclesiastes 12, 13, let us hear the whole, hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear Ahia, which like I showed you in the beginning, that is Father God. Fear Ahia and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Now, it, regardless if this was written in the old, the new, or the apocrypha, you think the whole duty of mankind, of why we're here, would change for any reason. The whole purpose of our existence is to be obedient to our creator. Keep it that simple. The father is not the author of confusion. Why would he write a bunch of stuff like this in the Old Testament if he wasn't supposed to use it for to move forward? What's the point of even writing this down? Seriously, though, what is the whole point of it? And I want to put some things in perspective. Well, first of all, churchianity would tell you that you go, you, you, you go into the heavens. That's completely false. If you read the whole Bible, it doesn't tell you that at all. After this life, we stay on earth. New Jerusalem, which is the heavens that will come down in Revelation 21 10, it says this, and he carried me away. It's talking, this is John saying, the angel carried him away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from Ahia. And so you continue reading. It comes down to earth. So we will be on earth. Why is that important? Because Jerusalem, or you can say New Jerusalem to separate the old Jerusalem. Jerusalem is in Israel. If Jerusalem is in Israel, and you want to be a part of Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, which is heaven on earth, then you have to become a part of Israel because where is Jerusalem? Israel. You don't go like in layman's terms or a basic example. If you get your citizenship in America, what do they call you? You can say, now say I'm an American because you have citizenship in America. And then if you have citizenship in America, you're now American. What laws do you keep? You keep America's laws because you live in America and you're now a citizen of a citizen of America. This is the same thing in the Bible. Nothing is over our boundaries of understanding. The Bible's written in a way for us to understand, just like the stuff that's happening in real time in life. If you want to be in New Jerusalem, which is heaven on earth in the millennium reign, then become Israel and then you adapt the laws of Israel to be in New Jerusalem. Doesn't that all make sense? And just clarifying, so many people you hear, uh, the, the, the laws are the, the Jews, the laws are the Jews' laws. No, the laws was given to the Jews because they were chosen, but they are the most high laws. They are his. The Jews doesn't decide. The Jews, the Israelites, no man on earth decides who becomes a part of the covenant. The Most High decides that. And as we see in Leviticus 23, his feast days, this is an example, just one example of his whole law, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. These are the Most High's laws and the Most High's feasts. 
So don't let no Israelite, so-called so Israelite, so-called Jew, tell you what you can or cannot do. Study to show thyself approved and understand that these are your laws if you want to choose to be a part of the covenant given to Israel. All right. So majority of people watching this is going to come, uh, not maybe not everyone, but the majority is going to come from some type of uh, domination of Christianity or Catholicism or somewhere around there. And, and everything's big on Messiah. So let's break this down that Messiah is also the Old Testament and not just the new. We Everybody wants to use the words of the Messiah, but the words of the Messiah is also the Old Testament and the Torah. It's the entire, he is the entire word, <laughs> all the words, as in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. So John 14.6, we know that Yasha or Yeshaya, which is Jesus, this is, uh, I mean, I'm not going to get into the names or nothing, but that's not his name. We'll just keep it that simple. Thus says unto him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So he is the word, which is the everything that is Ruach Kodesh inspired, that is breathed out of a man that is fully, fully in the Ruach, writing in the Ruach. Because this scripture isn't just written by a bunch of people that felt like they were uh, touched by the Most High. Because most people right now would say that. But well, could we really trust someone's writing that's probably don't even got half the stuff right. All of us is still building in correction every day. So the, uh, the scripture is not simply uh, some, some, some random guy that feels like he's special. This scripture is somebody that is writing through the Ruach. And we can see that when you read scripture, it hits different. It's alive. So we know that Messiah is the way, the truth, and the life. But the Torah is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no coincidences. This, the Bible is telling us a story and giving us understanding that all of it is connected. Uh, Psalms 119.1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the Torah of Ahia. Psalms 119. 142. Thy righteousness is the everlasting righteousness and thy Torah is the truth. Deuteronomy 32, 46 and 47. And he said unto them, set your hearts unto all the words. Let's keep that same energy. All the words, right? He is the word. So don't keep just a part of his word. Let's keep all the words to the best of our ability. Which I testify among you this day, which ye shall command your children to do, observe to do all the words of this Torah. So all the words of this Torah, for it is not a vain thing for you because it is your life. And through this thing, ye shall prolong your days in the land, whether ye go over Jordan to possess it. So the Torah is your life. The Torah is truth. And the Torah is the way. Huh, I wonder what the Ruach Kodesh is telling us, y'all. Seems very straightforward, right? And did you know, how many times have everybody heard, he kept the law, the all the law perfectly for us. Ain't no man, ain't no woman has ever kept every commandment in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And I would even say the 613, let me read this. Did you know that even Yeshaya did it, follow all 613 laws in the Torah? And I don't even... I don't even agree that there's 613 laws because within the 613, when you read them, they're very repetitive, very repetitive. I believe there's actually less than 613 in the first five books, but that's really not important. The point is showing you that it's no one's supposed to keep all 613. So I'm just saying that there's a lot of false understanding out there that it's actually much, much less than this. And we keep hundreds to thousands of laws from federal to state to even city. 
Go ahead and look it up. Google your city, your state, and federal laws. It's thousands of them, and we don't even blink at them. We have less than 613 laws, at least in the foundation of the truth, and everyone complains about it. It's pathetic, to be honest. We got to do better. He didn't, he didn't put us here uh, to, to, to give us a Torah that is impossible. That, is, that perception is false. When you read it for yourself, it is very obtainable, very obtainable. And it's a blessing. So now breaking down the 613 so-called uh, commandments in the Torah, you see that only 41% of the 613 is for everyone. So when I said Messiah couldn't keep all 613, you get someone that will be quick and be like, oh, that's blasphemy. It's like, calm down. Calm down and study. Calm down and stop trying to be have strife with uh, people. Because it's very logical when you break it down. Because Messiah wasn't a woman. There is laws in the in the Torah that is just for women. So that would be blasphemy for Messiah to keep a law for women. And honestly, he couldn't because some of them is when women's on their menstrual cycles, and that would be impossible. Some are for servants, like actual servants. That Messiah was not that. Farmers, Messiah was not a farmer. Uh, uh, the, the high priest, Messiah is our eternal high priest, but for the, the, the synagogues and stuff at that time, he was not. All of these are for separate groups. If you fit within that group, then you abide by that law. But you can't abide by something that you are not. If you do not have farm animals and you don't have a farm, then how could you follow the laws of, that abides to farmers? Very straightforward. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read this out. And as you can see, approximately 29% of the laws are specifically for, this is a priest in Hebrew, and uh, with about 30% divided into percentages for the high priest, judges, uh, sovereigns, servants, et cetera. And the remaining 41% actually apply to everyone who considers themselves part of Israel, regardless of the position or condition. It would be impossible for Yeshua to follow all 613 laws. He simply was perfect in the laws that abide to him, which is what we are called to do. Study to show thyself approved and find out what you need to do to be corrected with the Holy Scriptures. This is how we should walk when reading and studying the Torah. It, it applies to you that nothing is impossible through Mashiach, while being guided by the set-apart spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach Kodesh. We follow way more laws on a daily within our own cities and never think twice about it. Remember, Yeshia is the way. So maybe it's time to start following in the ways of our Messiah. Amen. And coming from the church, how many times y'all heard this now? That the, that the law is too hard to keep. But at the same sermon, you could be at the same exact sermon, they will be like, oh, we can. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me except the law. <laughs> Except the law. We can't do the law, though, <laughs> because it was too hard. But he took that away. It's, and if you're here listening, it's because you, know, you now are seeking truth because you know that stuff don't make no sense. Just, yes, exactly, Blair. Walking contradictions. I mean, goodness. That's why when um, I see Christians get into debates and people start poking at the laws, they fold, they crumble like a cookie because they have no foundation. They have no foundation if they are not keeping the Torah or they are acting like the Torah doesn't abide to them or doesn't exist anymore. The law fulfilled, question mark.
right? You'll be cursed if you start following the laws. You'll be cursed if you don't follow the laws. The point of saying you'll be cursed to follow them is a misunderstanding of Paul's letters, which Second Peter tells you you don't need to read Paul's letters if you don't have foundation of truth of the rest of the Bible. But does anybody read the whole Bible? No. Matthew 5, and this is another big verse that you see in uh, people that don't want to keep the commandments of the old. Think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And uh, you have to know a little bit of Hebrew, uh, have a little bit of Hebrew understanding. You don't really have to know Hebrew, but you need to have some Hebrew understanding to actually get the full comprehension of verse 13 in, uh, specifically. I mean, 18, excuse me, 18, because he's telling you not one thing will pass, not one jot or one tittle. This is the part I'm talking about. What is one jot and one tittle? These are words that are meant for Hebrew characters. A jot is, a, is the tenth lever, letter in the Hebrew alphabet in the smallest. It was written above the line. So in other words, he's saying not the smallest letter, which is right here. And then he says the tittle. A tittle is even smaller than a jot. A tittle is a letter extension, a pin stroke that can di di differentiate one Hebrew letter from another. So there is um, a Hebrew a letter, and I'm going to put my, my, my mouse over it, without the extension. So there's a Hebrew letter without this extension right here. But a tittle is that extension which changes the letter. So he is saying, he is being so literal that he's like not the smallest, small, smallest letter or even an extension to change a character of a letter shall no wise pass from the law. Very, very straightforward that he is not playing that the entire law is intact until all be fulfilled. And good gracious, y'all, it don't take a genius to understand that if we're still here, all isn't been fulfilled because if all was fulfilled, he would have his second coming would have happened already. He would be here. So we now can really say all hasn't been fulfilled because we're still here. And when you start denying the Torah and you are pushing away, it, it's different when you're ignorant. And when I say ignorant, I truly mean it. Like you really don't know. But when you start, when you start uh, looking more into things, and you start seeing that maybe I should start keeping the Torah, but you still refuse because you want to keep your holidays and you want to still eat pork, which we'll get more into later. Things change because now you're not under grace of ignorance anymore. Things change as proverbs 28 verse 9 says because now you're turning your turning away your ear from hearing the torah so your prayers will become an abomination that's how straightforward this is when you're in complete ignorance is different but when you have an idea that you should be keeping the sabbath you should be doing more than what you're doing but you are still pushing it away because you want to do what you want to do and be lawless because it's easier, it's more fun because you're playing with demons, then what you're doing it will not be blessed as you were in the beginning of your walk when you were in complete ignorance. This is scripture. This is, I, when, I, when I show stuff like this, trust me, I can give you 10 more verses that pretty much say something similar to this. You become more cursed and more under a spiritual demonic attacks when you are choosing not to keep the Torah instead of being under the grace of ignorance. And just to throw some precepts, the Torah is for everyone that chooses to be grafted into the covenant made to Israel. 
Once again, don't go and ask a so-called Jew or Israelite, can you become an Israelite? Read your Bible. Read your scripture. You don't need permission from any man to take hold of a covenant that was already extended to you through the word. Too many people, I mean, and I mean it, family, too many people come to me and say, man, this guy I was talking to said, I don't, I'm not going to be able to have found uh, salvation, even though I'm seeking to keep the Torah and to do what, what, what the Bible tells me. Why in the world? Who is this person? Is he the Messiah? You don't even know if he's going to make it. And I mean it because if he is pushing people away from the covenant, I guarantee you he is not going to make it. If he is telling people you're not going to make it, don't keep the Torah. There's no point of your life. That is not fruits of the spirit. He will not make it. So you're listening to a demon telling you not to keep the commandments. Read your Bible. It tells you what is gifted to every person. So let's get into it. Numbers 15, 15 and 16. One ordinance shall be both for you of the congregation and also for the stranger that soldiers with you. It ordinance forever in your generations as ye are, so shall the stranger be before Ahia. One law in one manner. This is the most high law. And guess, look, he extended it to the, it's, it's Israel's first. We're not going to boast against the branches and act, and act like it's not Israel's. And understand, it is Israel's. It was gifted to Israel through covenant. But that don't mean they can turn away you, no so-called Israelite or Jew can turn you away from keeping that covenant because it was extended to those that are strangers that wants to soldier in with Israel. That is our duty. Yes, we will be keeping it in New Jerusalem. That's the whole point of this life. So I, I'm going to get into that, Trey. I'm going to get into that, Trey. Isaiah 56 and 6, just showing another precept. Also the sons of the strangers that join themselves to the Most High. And how do they do that? Through the covenant, because it is the Most High's covenant. It is the Most High's law. It don't belong to no man. So don't ever let no man shake your faith. If you, you know you've been called on, you know that you have a higher purpose than these people that are just celebrating paganism and don't care about the word. You know you've been called on. Do not let anybody deter you away from your path of righteousness and seeking truth. To serve him, which is the whole duty of man, and to love the name of Ahia to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and taketh hold of my covenant, even them, this is talking about the strangers, will I bring to my holy mountain, this is, uh, this is Mount Zion, and to make them joyful in my house of prayer, their burnt offering, and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people, all people, all people, Yasharala. Yasharala is deprived of all people when it's all said and done. I said I'm going to get to it, Trey. <laughs> I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. I got you. All right. In the next slide, I'm going to get to it. A lot of people uh, want to say Old Testament versus New Testament. They're the same. <laughs> Don't separate it. Do not separate it. The Old Testament is the base and foundation of the New Testament. So in Matthew 22, when he says, Master, which is the great commandment in the Torah? Messiah, Yahshua said unto him, Thou shalt love Ahia with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. 
Y'all know that the first four commandments is how you serve our creator by having no gods before him, by having no graven images of gods, pretty much. And ye shall not take his name in vain and keep in the Sabbath day. It's all signs between us and our creator. So the first commandment that he gave is a commandment that is showing is is breaking down just like a Ten commandments is a um a i don't want to say summary but um compacted summary of the entire law this is like the starting point the Ten commandments is the starting point but then you go and you study more you study more and then you get more wisdom and then you adjust little by little and then he said this is the first and great commandment. There you go. How to honor your creator can be summarized in these four commandments. And then he says, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And what do you know? The last six commandments of the 10 is loving thy neighbor, your, which is can be uh, your, your, your parents, father and mother, honor your father and mother, that you shall not kill them. Or I would say murder. We'll go over that in a, in, in a little bit later. Now, you should not commit adultery. Obviously, if you're committing adultery, you're not loving your neighbor. You are still in, you are stealing his wife or his husband. Thou shalt not steal from them. Thou shalt not build false witness. And thou shalt not covet it. All these things you don't do. You can't do this to the creator. These are things you do to man. You do to your neighbor. On these two commandments, hey, you see why I put have them hanging? <laughs> They're hanging because all these two commandments hang all the Torah and the prophets. Why do you think it says this? On these two commandments hang all the Torah and the prophets because this is a compressed summary of the Torah and how you honor the creator and your neighbor. But it gets more detailed. That's why I was saying the Torah tells you much more detail on how to honor your neighbor and love them. For example, you know the Torah, there's a commandment in the Torah that says, it's a commandment that if you see livestock, like nowadays, let's say your, your, your neighbor's dog is out on the loose and you're available to help them get their dog and put it back in the backyard or a cage because the dog's running around, it literally tells you, help your neighbor with their livestock if they are out in there are astray so you see the the torah gives in-depth instructions on how what the the how we should carry ourselves on how to love our neighbor this is really vague in a sense of the entire torah he wants more out of us and it goes in detail when you read about it this is that's kind of the whole gist of it this is in real basic terms but hey if you actually go read the Torah, I, I want you to go even more than this. Let me really break down what I mean, love your neighbor. Yes, if you love me, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Amen. All right, this is for you, Trey. What did it mean when he said to fulfill? Well, it's I, 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 I legit just searched as it is written, and I search fulfill, because it tells you this is what, as it is written, it tells you that the, and I made sure this is just Romans. I, I, this is just a Roman screenshot. Every time it says, as it, as it, as it is written, it's telling you this foundation of writing is based in the Old Testament or the Torah. If this is just Romans, and I, you see it cut off. This is just Romans 1 and 9. And it's, said, and it's already said 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And it, I, I, this is just a preview. <laughs> as it is written, as it is written, as it is written, as it is written. The New Testament is built on the old. Because where is it written, family? So understand that. You can do this with any book. Every book has a bunch of as it is written because the foundation is the old. How would all of this writing be written 
if it wasn't quoting from something else. And then fulfill. What does fulfill mean? He's saying it in real time, just like I said, this is just in the beginning of the book of Matthew. Now, all of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Ahia, by the prophets. That uh, and there was, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Ahia, by Ahia, by the prophets, saying, out of Misraim have I called my son. So when he said, I've come to fulfill He's come to fulfill the prophecies that was written about him by the prophets in the Old Testament. <laughs> Straight up. So as clear as day. He's come to fulfill the prophecies that was written about him. The Old Testament, the entire Old Testament was written about him. And this is just a snippet. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken, da 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 da, might be fulfilled. What it says that no why the past till all be fulfilled, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. That's what it means. It's just that simple. <laughs> so many people go, well, what he fulfilled the whole law? Yes, he fulfilled the laws that abided to him, and then he fulfilled the prophecies that was uh, prophesied about him. But guess what? We have prophecies of his second coming to gather his people, which means all hasn't been fulfilled yet. So we're still here. The covenant is still here because we're not in a new earth, in a new, in a new Jerusalem, because we're still here. All hasn't been fulfilled. I'm telling you, like, it's so straightforward when you look at it. He tells you over and over in all the uh, all the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He did this so it might uh, so it could be fulfilled. So it might be fulfilled. So it was fulfilled, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He's telling you the all the prophecies are about him. And thank goodness he fulfilled them and will fulfill them again for our sakes, because we ain't nothing without him. He is the vine. We are the branches. Yes, uh, I got you. Let's 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 read that, uh, Deja. Hebrews 10, 26. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, and what do we just know? We already know. It straight up says, Hebrews 10, 26. If we continue to sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, and what is truth? Torah. This is what I was talking about with uh, with uh, uh, Proverbs 28, 9. After you receive the knowledge of the truth, you can't sin willfully or your prayers become an abomination. I didn't even finish reading uh, Hebrews 10, 26. Let me read it. Excuse me. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Because now you become a walking abomination to the Most High. You have turned away because, uh, let's think about this. If you have been praying, if you have been praying for enlightenment, and you have been praying to be um, delivered, and the Most High sends you a messenger, which could be me, which could be any of you that are disciples of the word. And that person goes, no, nah, I, ain't, I ain't trying to do that, man. The, the, my pastor said this. I don't want to fact check my pastor. I, I'm not trying to do that. Then he is turning his way from the law, and he, don't, he is confirming that he doesn't want to listen to the Most High because the Most High has always sent messengers. That's why the Bible was written by man. Written by man because men are the messengers of the Most High. So that and, and that being said, family, it, messengers can be through anyone. It even can come through sinful people. The Most High can send you a message through anyone. So when we are engaging in, in just everyday conversation or just walking by in small talk with some random person, always keep your eyes open, your ears peeled. 
because most high, the most high could deliver a message that you've been waiting on. And it could come from someone that is least expected. Always be ready to humble yourself. Always, because that message could be from the most high. Do not turn away your ear from something that is correction. Or that's wisdom. But you don't respect this person, so you don't want to hear from them. But man, that one minute conversation that he told you was right on. But you don't want to listen to him because you don't want to be humble. All right, let's continue. Well, you're not done. You can you can repent. There is levels to this. Now, if you, the, the unforgivable sin is someone that knows the truth and on purpose is dividing his kingdom and turning people away. That's bad. That's the worst thing you can do. Outside of that, you can always repent and you can always improve and, um, you know, turn away from sins. He, if he is still involved in your life and he is still calling you, and you know if the most high is calling you, you know, then take upon, take, grab upon uh his hand, his covenant, and that's how you grab his hand. You want to walk with Messiah? The only way you grab his hand and walk with Messiah is taking a hold of his covenant. That's how you follow him, that's how you walk with him. That's how you become intimate with him. That's how you build a relationship with him, is that you believe and then you follow his commandments. All right. So now we're going over the 10 commandments. Some of them are very straightforward, won't take much time, but some of them are not. Some have just been taught wrong, just like all the stuff we've been going over. All the things that I just went over, I didn't know when I first got in, in an in a idea of a full understanding. And that's why I'm going over it all, because so many things have been taught incorrect, of um, the, the foundation of truth. And the foundation of the truth is exactly what we just read. All uh, on these two commandments hang all the Torah and the law, I mean, in the prophets. So let's, uh, let's, let's go over them, right? Makes sense to go over something that hangs all the law and the prophets. First commandment, other mighty ones or gods, Exodus 22 and 3. I am Haya, thy Allahi, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And then other precepts that kind of say the same thing, different uh, way to say it right here. And uh to a lot of people don't understand, well, when they first come into the truth and they uh, getting out of uh, holidays, that that holidays are worshiping of other gods. Birthday is a worshiping of you being your own God. Yes, sirree. Like uh, Christmas is a sun worship. Easter is a fertility, uh, fertility worship. Um, Halloween is satanism just a pure satanism um day valentine's day is um uh, man i even try to go over all these guys you can look all these up individually every single one of these days even mother's day father's day because what did we just read honor thy father father and thy mother we don't need a day to do that family we don't need a day to do that these days or these dates, these pagan dates are there for a reason. And Thanksgiving, all of these are worshiping of other gods, other deities, or self-worship, which is kind of the worst one because self-worship is, is a source of pride itself. And uh, the one thing I will say about birthdays, I mean, you can go out to eat any day. I don't think like just going, you know, just having a, a meal, but the, the birthday cake, blowing out the candles, think about that. You, when you understand that we are supposed to be a light, 
Isn't it ironic on a birthday, you blow out your candle? Think about that. You make a wish. Think, uh, the foundation of it is so pagan. You're making a wish. Who is answering your wishes? Aren't we supposed to be praying? Wish upon a star. Who are the stars? Angels. So you're wishing to angels or you're wishing on your birthday? Who's answering these wishes? And why are you blowing out your light? The candles on the cake is a representation of you. And you're blowing out your light, making a wish to who? You see how easy they got you? They got us? It's so easy. But it's fun. It's so normal, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't matter. Correct yourself. So like I said, a meal is a meal. I have a meal any day. I, I, I don't want to go too extreme and say you can't have a meal. But the traditions built around pagan birthdays, like I said, everyone gathered around one person, giving them gifts, crowning them as a king or queen that day, and, and doing all this excessive celebrations, that is idol worship. And the idol is that person. A thousand percent. If you look into the Church of Satan, the high, the highest day of uh, Satanism is one's birthday because it is the most prideful day of the year. Pride is, is the fall of man. And yes, thank you, George. I was just about to say that. The only two birthdays recorded in the Bible were by pagans, King Herod and a Pharaoh. Oh, aren't we not supposed to be like the other nations? And the only example of birthdays in the Bible are other nations. Oh, man. It's like, and it's like, and that's why, like, with your children, just take them out to eat. Say, I love you, sweetie. You're, you've grown beautiful this last year. And carry on, family. Carry on. So understand, you could be you could be the God that you're worshiping over the Most High. And there's many ways. This is not limited to this list. This is not limited at all. I'm just, for those that don't know, I just want, I'm trying to wrap around your head that there's many ways to put gods before the Most High. Do not be fooled by anything. And I mean it. Any tradition that you don't find in the Bible, you probably shouldn't do. And I really mean it because, all I mean, from my studying, it's everything. We're in the last days, which means everything has been polluted. There's nothing that's not. So that's why it's important to study. Yeah, and, and, and understand this. A lot of people... A lot of people uh, want to be like, well, what are we supposed to do? I've talked to uh, someone that was in Christianity. What are we supposed to do if we don't keep the, if we don't have holidays? Are you kidding me? We have uh, a weekly holiday, a weekly uh, mo moed, a moedim, a appointed time, a holy day, Sabbath. We have seven annual Sabbaths throughout the entire year. And then we have four new moon festivals throughout the year, and then we even have uh, two uh, days of remembrance of Feast of Dedication and Purim. So what? What are we supposed to do? That sounds like we have plenty to do, family. <laughs> plenty. What is that? The weekly Sabbath one, the seven, that's eight, the four, that's 12, and then if you count the days of remembrance of Dedication and Purim, that's 14 days to give glory to our creator. So if you're wondering what to do if you're not doing Christmas, Thanksgiving, there you go. There's plenty. And they're just as fun. They're not just as fun. They're more fun because the, mo the most high is blessing you on that day and you're commuting with the heavenly bodies because guess what? On earth as it is in heaven, we are on his clock. Our Shabbat is his Shabbat. 
He is feasting and fellowshipping, fellowshipping with us instead of being against him on a pagan day. We are with him. Elevate yourself with the heavens if you want to be heavenly. That's the end goal of this life of the soul that we've been given is to become as the heavens, which is all righteous and all pure. Yes, so much more fulfilling. It's not even it's not even comparable. Uh, uh, everybody knows Christmas is one of the stressful, most stressful times of the year. I ain't never been stressed on a feast day. Yes, you could, you know, try to get stuff done and you want to do this and that, but like, oh, damn, I got presents. Am I rapping it? Am I lying to my children about doing stuff? Uh, oh, my goodness. Like, save all that. Going broke on, on paganism. Don't even make no sense. All right. Uh, second commandment. Carved images. Exodus 20, verse 4 and 5. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. And I put carved because I, I, I want to break this down. A lot of basic people that are in church don't even understand what graven means. This word means carved, literally carved. What is carved? Anything that takes a shape. That's what carved means. A lot of people, oh, this doesn't mean the cross. The cross is a carved image guys is carved did he give it to you and save for you to hang it up no he didn't or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth you see how he literally said everything pretty much anything on the earth in the waters or in the heavens anything that takes shape that wasn't given to you thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, Ahaya the Allahim, am a jealous Allahim, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And that's, that's right there. That's generational curses right there. A lot of us are breaking generational curses, family, because those that worship idols, you see, it's passed down to third to fourth generations of them that hate me. And how do you hate him? By serving carved images and other gods. So you break generational curses by repenting and to stop doing it and start to serve him. Very, very straightforward stuff. Uh, uh, context, let me see. Yeah, context, Deuteronomy 4, 28. And there ye shall serve gods, the work of men's hands. Carved images is the same thing as graven images. Carved is the works of man's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. What does that sound like? We already know religion. He literally says, don't make a carved image by anything in the heavens. This ain't even what a star looks like, even though we call it a star. This is actually very, uh, I have a video called Code of Mankind. They call this a star for deception, but it is much deeper. I'm not going to go into that. You can watch that video if you choose, though, because that is a very in-depth topic. And actually, all three of these are a part of that Code of Mankind study, because all of these is much deeper than one may think. So all of these takes a carved shape. A cube, Islam, Christianity, slash Catholicism, and Judaism, the mainstream world, uh, the mainstream religion that supposedly says they serve the, the true creator. All are idolatry, all of them. This is, they're all serving other, other gods by doing so. And I want to add on that some people go, well, I, I'm doing this for Jesus. You know what's funny? That sounds very similar to the golden calf. Because they, made, did you know that they didn't make the golden calf to 
to uh, deny the most high. They made the golden calf for the most high. And get, you, we know what happens. Exodus 32, 4 and 5. And he received the gold from their head, hand and fastened it with a graven tool. And made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Yasharala, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to Ahia. It says the, because I changed this Lord, to the Lord, but that is still the, the name of the Most High right there. So they made the golden calf for our creator, and the, our creator put them to death. So next time you think you're doing something for the most high that he didn't tell you to do, remember the golden calf. He ain't playing with that. Oops, it says one, it is the third. The name of the most high, Ahaya, Exodus 27, thou shalt not take the name of Ahaya, the Allahim in vain. For the Most High will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. So most of us will say that if, uh, oops, most of us will say that, well, not say now, but that comes out of religion, you would say taking the Lord's name in vain is saying God. Oh my God, bruh, if that ain't the most, <laughs> oh my goodness, it's just, that's so bad. It's such bad doctrine. First of all, God isn't a name. It's a title. Second of all, God isn't even an appropriate title for the Most High. Third of all, that's not even the meaning of the, of the third commandment. It's horrible. The context of this, guess where you can find the context? It's found in scripture. It's not just based off of some random theory that someone thought of. Everything, family, every single thing you can find in scripture. He's not going to give you a commandment and no explanation on what it means. And you just have to guess. It's found in scripture. So when we go to scripture, Matthew 15, 8, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And this is pretty much quoting from Isaiah 29, 13. And Ahiah said, because this people draw near with me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by man. What was taught by man? That, oh my God, oh my God, is taking his name in vain. So, Commandments taught by man is blasphemy. Taking the Most High's name in vain is saying that you are a disciple, that you are a believer, but then going and being a pagan, being a Luciferian, being a heathen, doing Christmas, and telling people that it's okay to do Christmas, to wear crosses. You are breaking the third commandment where you say with your mouth, that you are a believer of the, the, the God of the Bible, but you go around walking around not keeping one commandment that is in the Bible. Make it make sense with scripture, family. Let's make it make sense with some scripture. And that's why the Bible over and over and over uh, keeps telling you made by man, man's traditions over and over again. So if anything, anyone ever tells you and, uh, something, if they don't have a verse, and it was made by man. It's really that simple. It's so simple. And you'll see how simple it is if you're still like, for, you know, there's some people that's slowly trans, uh, transitioning out of church. So they're still in church. If you ask me, do uh, I don't have a, a fellowship or anything nearby, I still go to church. Would you go to the church of Satan? No. These churches are worshiping Satan. They, I just showed you. Did they not have Christmas? Uh, uh, did they, do they not have Christmas trees on Christmas? Do they do they do do a lot of these churches do trunk or treat on Halloween? 
They all celebrate this giving. They all uh, they 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 keep the commandment to to keep their pockets full because they want to uh, uh they they pass around the tray, the offering tray, but they don't keep the rest of the old. They it's blasphemy. These are these people in churches are luciferians what's the difference between a satanist and a luciferian a satanist will openly tell you that they don't want to keep any laws they want to be free of law that is what satanism is luciferianism is someone that's what freemasons are that's why masons use the bible freemasons i mean uh luciferians are somebody that say they're believers but they're not they are disguising themselves as a false light that is what lucifer is Lucifer is a false light God. That's what the Statue of Liberty is. Because America is a representation of a false light uh, a, a country. Everyone says America was built on Christianity. Well, you're right about that. It was built on Christianity. But Christianity in disguise is Luciferianism. They worship other deities. You have to remove yourself from devil worshipers. Because they are. That's why they will burn unless they repent. It's just, I, I'm not being harsh. I'm being straightforward because your whole life, everybody's been sugarcoating the Bible. And on Judgment Day, there's no sugarcoating. If you're still honoring these other gods, you will not make it to the kingdom. Facts. Don't play yourself. These churches follow laws according to man, and they will burn like the Bible tells them they will. I'm not going to sugarcoat it in my ministry because you got to hear this because this is not a game, family. This is not a game. All right. So taking his name in vain and saying you're a disciple and then going around doing things that worship other deities and then telling those people that it's okay. That's breaking the third commandment. The Shabbat. Oh, the Shabbat. The Shabbat. Exodus 20 or the Sabbath. Like I said at the beginning, Shabbat is Hebrew word for Sabbath. Exodus 20, verse 8 and 11. Remember. It's funny how um, it says remember. And then they say we shouldn't remember it. It doesn't matter. It's funny, right? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it. Kodesh, holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Ahia thy Elohim. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is in within thy gates. For in six days Ahia made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is that in them is and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Most High blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And precepts upon precepts upon precepts. There's so many precepts for the, the Sabbath day. Um, and um, take it from the Targum. The Targum is a Aramaic translation, it, it, which is, it mean, uh, I say, uh, if you don't know, that means it's an older book that has a little bit more uh, context in it because it has been less touched by man because man has been slowly manipulating and that not changing the meaning well sometimes we'll get over to get that but uh the, in other words the truth still is in the the uh, the bible today it's just harder to find than it was in the old so let me read it exodus 31 13 and 14 ye shall keep the day of my sabbaths Indeed, for it is a sign between my word. So this is a sign between me, us and Messiah. My word in you, that you may know that I am the Adon, the master who sanctify you. Ye shall keep the Sabbath because it is set apart, which is another word for holy or in Hebrew, Kodesh, because it is holy to you. Whosoever profaneth it, dying, he shall die. Huh, what I just say about these churches that says the Sabbath day is done away with. This is not a game. They will burn if they do not repent. This is not me saying it. This is scripture. Don't fellowship with those in darkness. 
You can always speak to sinners about the truth, but continuing to go to church every Sunday, fellowshipping with those people is going to get you possessed by demons or something. They're going to be, you're not going to be able to sit still in that place. They ain't going to want you there. Whosoever doeth work therein, that man shall be destroyed from his people. And um, wow, the Sabbath day is so intense. Um, one second, I got to pull something up here. I was going to show, uh, I'm not going to go over my entire, um, my entire, the entire Sabbath on here. I'm just going to point you to my video and you can, after you watch it, you can, um, one second. Okay. Okay. Let me get back here. I am not going to go over all the details. I'm going to go over, I'm about to go over just the outline of the Sabbath, but the calendar is a loss understanding in our time more than than ever um let's let me get back to the slides here let me show you something so i'm going to point you i'm going to point you to oh share screen loading okay there we go i'm going to point you to this uh this study right here called uh, Path of Righteousness, Sabbaths, Feast Days, and New Moons. Every believer needs to understand the calendar at least a little bit. I know it's hard and maybe not everyone can make a calendar because, uh, I mean, the Bible even tells you that only, only certain people at every time in history that could read the luminaries because uh, this, the calendar is the luminary. So in other words, I'm just saying it's really hard for some folks. And, but I'm not saying that you need to like, be able to write up a calendar, but you need to, everyone needs to have basic understanding. This video probably needs to be watched. No lie. I'm not even exaggerating when I say this at least three times. It's that intense because we're all unlearned. So we really have to study to show thyself approved. You're not going to get something the first time that you've never heard of before. And that's contradicting things that you have been taught that your mind and your subconscious is holding on to for dear life to be comfortable. So just want to point that you have to watch this video to understand the calendar, which is the foundation of the Sabbath and all his other appointed times. So because these are uh, appointment, these are appointments. When you go into the feast days and the Sabbaths, the Hebrew word for these are actually not feast. They're, they're called feast days in English, but that is not what the, uh, they are. They're actually, the, the more corrected term is appointments. So if you have an appointment with your doctor and you show up at uh, on Tuesday, and you show up at Wednesday, you think they're going to take you? Nah, they're not. <laughs> they're going to tell you you missed your appointment and to reschedule and hopefully you can make it next time. They're not going to tell you to that is completely fine that you can come anytime you want. So that being said, you need to watch the video, but we're going to go over the foundations of the Sabbath right here. So the Sabbath is, like I said, I'm not going to go in crazy detail. That's for the video. There's a reason why I made a two hour plus video because it's that intense and I break it down with so much more scripture than I'm going to do in this one. But Sabbaths and days are sunrise to sunset. Yes, literally daytime. There's no such thing as a 24-hour clock in scripture. Messiah literally says, is there not 12 hours in a day? And that's just an example because like right now we're in winter. So there's actually less than 12 hours in a day. It's the darkest time of the year right now. But he was pointing that day is equal to light. Go ahead and pull open Genesis 1 verse 5. Read it right now to you. The Bible makes up definitions for what, what he has created and has determined for us. Genesis 1 verse 5, and Elohim called light day. He called light day, 
in the darkness he called night. So when he says day, he literally means light in the sunlight and darkness is night. That's why it, um, when you go into the stories, why do you think when Messiah and Moses fasted for 40 days, they didn't say 40 days. They said 40 days and 40 nights because they're giving you description that they're fasting day and night. Why do you think when Jonah was in the well or Messiah was in the uh, belly of the earth, Sheol, it says he, they were in it for three days and three nights. Why do they give us these descriptions? Because there is a separation of day and night. He separated day and night. That is in verse four. Uh, yes, in verse four of Genesis chapter one. And Allahim saw the light that it was good and he divided the light from the darkness. So that's just, I mean, man, that's just it's so much more than that. You see off top how that blows your clock that we have been given out the water, just blows it out. They're separate. So when he says a day, he means a day. When he says night or darkness, he means that. There's no such thing as a 24-hour clock. There's light, there's darkness, and then he, there is time mentioned, like the 3 o'clock hour and et cetera, but that's not the same thing as we've been taught. Thank you for adding that scripture, by the way. Yo, I, it's because I sip old red wine, you know? I'm not over here guzzling it down. This this little glass going to last me the whole study in some. Man. Uh, just just a sweet red wine is the best. What a gift. He has given us gifts. Red wine is a gift. Um, if you have a righteous woman like my wife, <laughs> shouts out to my wife. She's in the chat. Um, she's a gift. The Most High has given us gifts. We just need to treat them right. We shouldn't be, I shouldn't be a glutton over this wine. I shouldn't mistreat my wife. She is a gift. It's a blessing to be here. He, he has given us the Sabbath, these feast days, gifts such as wine, such as righteous wives or husband. He doesn't want us to have a lame life. The most high is, I think the most high is pretty lit. <laughs> He likes to have fun. He wants us to fellowship. He wants us to communion, to have communion with each other. He wants us to, to be, I mean, the most high is, is I think it's, it's, he's such a cool father. I, I think so many people are missing who he is. He's given us so many things. Like there is people in church that's telling you not to drink wine. Guys, this is a gift. <laughs> It's a gift. Don't be a drunkard, but he's given us this as a gift. Let's not, let's not go take anything out of proportion or take something and add to it. Don't take away what the Bible or the scripture says or add to it. Take it and, and uh, treat it responsibly. All right. That was a little side note. <laughs> Heck yeah. The Most High, think about it. The Most High has built us in the image of the angels through Messiah. Messiah is an angel, if you don't know. He is the first son of the Most High. Angels are sons of God. And we're made in their image. He, they, he's given us laughter and joy. He has made us, a lot of us, comedians, jokesters. I think the Most High laughs at us at times because I think he's like, that was funny. <laughs> he's made us like what his persona of what he wants us to be. Y'all don't think they laugh and sing in the heavens? Are you kidding me? I think they do that, especially on the days that they come together in communion. Laughter extends your life. It decreases stress. It legit is well, is it builds up a well-being of your body. You don't think he laughs? 
everything that is we are made of especially all well not especially all the good things that is that does good for us is a product of him so absolutely absolutely Like, especially when you laugh and you cry because it's so funny. And how many times have you said, man, I needed that. I needed that. Because it is, man, that is just natural food for your soul. It makes your soul smile. And I 100% believe the most high could be making jokes. I, I don't see why not. We're made in his image, are we not? Such a gift. I'm made indeed. Yeah, we don't want to be too serious now. Like there is things that we 100% we got to be serious about. But in our day to day, talking to each other, and um, you know, like if we're keeping commandments and we're just in communion, we're, we're making jokes and like, come on, we there. There's levels to everything. Okay, so uh, sunrise to sunset is the Sabbath. Because the Messiah is Lord of the Sabbath day, and that is in his light, in his presence, because we are children of the light. That's another thing that I'm not going far into. Let's continue. On Sabbath days, we observe. What does observe mean? Observe mean to acknowledge it's a Sabbath day and to keep the commandments that is given for the Sabbath day. And that is to feast and to give him praise, as in, in Jubilees 2, verse 22. Guard the Sabbath with us on the seventh day to eat and to drink and to bless him who has created all things. Then we have a set apart gathering. And I say set apart gathering because on the Sabbath, you ain't supposed to gather with a bunch of heathens that's going to be cursing and acting a fool and doing all this worldly stuff. No, you want to gather with those and we're doing it online right now in spirit but you want to gather with those that are honoring the most high with you. And in doing so, we do not work. Work means buying and selling. You go into a store, if you're buying something, somebody's going to have to be working. Regardless, online or in person, buying or selling is work. Or um, just or just being on the clock. Uh, doing any, any manual labor outside, it's work. Uh, six days uh, in Leviticus 23 and 3, six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of a salam rest, a holy convocation, that is a gathering. Ye, uh, you shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Most High in all dwellings. And then, like I said, no buy or sell. If And if the people of the land bring in goods or, or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath day or, or on a holy day, Nehemiah 10, 31. And then no sex. And this is why we go over this. A lot of people do not know that sex isn't a sin if you're doing it with your, your wife or your husband. It's not a sin, but it is an act that is unclean. When you read the Torah, it tells you when uh, you have intercourse, you are unclean until evening. We're not supposed to do anything that makes you unclean on a holy day or Sabbath. So Jubilee specifies in 50 verse 8, the man that does any work on it shall die. Whosoever, uh, da -da -da, who, uh, here he goes, whosoever lies with his woman or whosoever says he will do something on it, shall die. I cut it off, but it's just the point that having sex on the Sabbath day is an unclean act. It's not a sin. What if you do it on the Sabbath, it is a sin. But any other day of the week, it's not a sin with the right person, uh, be, but it is an act that will make you unclean. This is why we're going over this, family. I didn't know that when I first got into the Sabbath until months later, studying the Torah, it's reading other books and whatnot. So this is why we're going over it. Parents, 
Honor your parents, the fifth commandment. So like I said, this is, this is just a really vague understanding of it. There's much more. Keep doing your research. But this right here will set you right. This right here enough will set you right for the Sabbath. But there, there's always more understanding. Like I said, this, it, this study is called Intro to the Torah. This isn't the entire understanding of everything. Continue seeking with all of this. Fifth commandment, parents, Exodus 20, verse 12, honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which Ahiah thy Elohim giveth thee. Context, Exodus 21, 15, and who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. 17, and he who curses his father and his mother shall surely be put to death. So let me, let me, let me say this real quick. So I know there's plenty of people that struggle with relationships with their father and their mother. Uh, could be from a childhood upbringing. They were just, could be uh, druggies, just bad parents, abusive. Or it could be you started following Torah and now your relationship is horrible because they love paganism and they hate that you don't do Christmas and et cetera. It doesn't matter. How do you honor your father or your mother when your relationship is crap? It's no good. By exactly what we just read. You don't listen to them if they're if they're trying to persuade you to uh, not keep the commandments. You never do that. You never put anyone up, uh, above the most high. But you honor them by not cursing them, by not being disrespectful. If they curse you out, you hold your anger. You pray for them and you dismiss yourself. You become the bigger person because you're walking in the Ruach and they're not. You don't return and you don't retaliate. And the other thing, I mean, I hope nobody's abusive like that, but hitting your parents, cursing them, saying, I hate you, that's not good. You're better than that. You're walking in the Ruach. Pray for strength. Pray to be slow to anger. Pray for them to their, for their, their demons to be released for them to be uh, the truth to be revealed to them and that's really all i can say i know everybody's situation is different but you have to find a foundation of love and just and that could be simply praying for them and not talking to them if they're crazy just literally dismiss yourself but that never means you listen to them, especially if we're talking about as adults. We're not talking about little children. Of course, little children have a different type of grace. So you don't want to be a bad baby kid doing whatever to your parents and you're 10 years old. This is talking about adults. Adults, you make your own decision as an adult. You don't listen to your parent that's telling you to do stuff that's not uh, according to the word. All right. The six, I put murder. A lot of translations. Remember, this is English. This is not Hebrew. A lot of the translations are not great. So they say, thou shalt not kill. That is wrong. It's murder. Thou shalt not murder. And the context is because technically in the Torah, there is the penalty of death. We've read multiple verses already that says, thou shalt be put to death if thou break this commandment. In Leviticus 20, verse 27, a man or a woman who is a medium or who has familiar spirits, pretty much someone doing witchcraft, shall surely be put to death. How will they be put to death? The Most High is not going to do it. The people did. They shall stone them with stones and their blood shall be upon them. So there was two main death penalties in ancient Israel for those that were doing witchcraft or abominations in the land. It was either stoning or hanging on trees. And uh, I wouldn't even say, if I understand correctly, if I remember right, most of the people that even was hung on trees wasn't even hung. They were, I think they were dead before they were hung um, on a tree. So.
So, uh, yeah, just that simple. It's just the fact of thou shalt not murder is the correct translation here. But at the same time, we're not in the land of Israel with these laws. So don't think you have the authority to go and stone anybody because this was done through a judicial system that was a part of a government of Israel or whatever you want to call it, establishment of Israel that sisses people to death when things was confirmed by two to three witnesses and so on. I just want to specify that thou shalt not kill is a false translation because people had to be killed for the death penalty at that time. Just want to clarify that. Seven, adultery. These are very straightforward now. I think, yeah, the last seven through 10 is very straightforward. Adultery, uh, well, adultery isn't that straightforward. Um, I'm not going into polygamy, but polygamy is Torah. That might shake a lot of people a little bit. Polygamy is Torah, but it's only for the man. So how did uh, Jacob have multiple wives? And it wasn't adultery. Well, first of all, he didn't steal anybody's wife, which is the true act of adultery. Uh, so he wasn't sitting. But in other words, that's another study which you could uh, ask me about if you really want to. I've talked about that in other studies. But adultery pretty much means don't be chasing other people's spouses. That's very obvious. That's a part of, you know, coveting as well. Um, fornication is actually used more, more with spiritual fornication in the Bible. Um, is talking about worshiping of other gods most of the time with fornication. Um, adultery is like I said, sleeping with uh, somebody that is somebody else's. And that could be man or woman. Then we have stealing. I mean, it's, if it's not yours, don't take it. But I will also say this about stealing. If you say you're going to borrow something and you never return it or say, hey, man, I forgot I had this. And you don't let them know that you have it. And you, you say, hey, but can I keep it? Because you don't want it. And if they say, okay, it's okay. But if you say, I'm going to borrow something and you never return it, that's stealing. <laughs> Just saying. Let's be real. Lying, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, which is can also be an abomination because if you're doing this a part of a community of the Most High and you're creating division by bearing false witness, ooh, you're in hot water, very hot water. Because um, there is sin that leads to death, but not all sin is the penalty of the death stoning that we just read about. There is levels to this. And um, some are called, abom are called abominations which means they are at the utmost ick, yuck, for the Most High. He doesn't like it at all. And lastly, coveting. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, which would be adultery. Thou shalt not, I mean, nor his maid, manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And uh, just going into the, the definition of covenant, uh, delight in, desire. Um, yeah, so if you're looking at something that isn't yours, that you know will never be yours, and it's not supposed to be yours, check your eyeballs. Your eyes is the window to your soul. This is how sin begins. If you looking at your neighbor's wife and you're highly attracted to her and every time you're at, she's outside, you're looking at her and then you find a way to small talk with her. And then now you want to, you want to try to hang out with her. That's how it all happens. That's all. That's how, that's how all things happen when it's cheating or stealing or anything. 
It starts with the windows of your soul, your eyes. So check yourself. Pray for, for strength not to look at your attractive wife or to not be doing anything that feels like you're, you know, going to be going to lead you to any transgression. And uh, coveting is um, breaking the entire uh, commandment of loving thy neighbor in one commandment. In 1 John 5, 2 and 3, by this we know that we love the children of the Most High when we love Ahia and keep his commandments. So we know that we love the children of the Most High when we love Ahia and keep his commandments for this is the love of the Most High Ahia that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. And real, so I want to go over to feast days. So let's let's check this out real quick. Let's do. Let's go to Google. Let's do. Let's see. I'm gonna look in. Um, let me see. Yep. Yeah, what are the seven feast days in the Bible? And we go to this, this is what the world would tell you. The seven feast days in the Bible, we have Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruit, Shavuot, Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and Feast of Tabernacles. And this is why we're going over this, because this is not the correct list. But this is what, Eric, this, wait a minute, this is what the world says. What do you mean this is what it says in the Bible? No, it doesn't. No, it, it does not. They are marked every appointed time, which is uh, translated as feast day, is marked by a holy convocation slash Sabbath. These are the feasts of the Most High, even holy convocations, or like I said, Sabbaths, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons, which is the weekly Sabbath, obviously. And then we have Passover, unleavened bread, Shavuot. Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Tabernacles, and then the eighth day. So just that little bit right there. They put that this first fruits found in the week of unleavened bread is a feast day. It is wrong. This is not a feast day. It is a day to uh, recognize, and, and it has meaning, but it's not a feast day. The, the eighth day after Feast of Tabernacles is actually the last um, Moed appointed time. And I have this feast day right here. Feast day tutorial. It's only, it's less than eight minutes long. It tells you exactly the basics of all that we know that we need to do for all eight Moedims, the weekly Sabbath and the seven annual feasts. You can find it right here. Feast day tutorials. The, the, you see the tension in the details. How Hasatan slowly adjusts a little thing, a little bit to deter you from the truth, and that is also Judaism. So you're telling me the real Jews, if they, they call themselves the real Jews, don't even know the the Moedim of the Most High, because they are not the Moedim of the Most High. Continuing. Oh, I, I just want to make sure I show you all the feast day tutorial. So the food law, I um I I'm doing a study. I decided I moved up the food law. I'm doing this study sometime within the month. So if you're watching this later, it might be already posted, but I don't I don't have it yet. But I don't even want to put a food laws list in here because I want to double check it myself. I have not done an open discussion and study on the food law line by line yet. And so I will do this very soon. Uh, but if you want a food law list right now, you can message me. I do have one that I have been using that I've been trusting, but I want to I, I want to double check and verify that moving forward. So I won't post it on here. So contact me or if you're watching this later, just check first. Check on the, my YouTube because it most likely will be there if you're watching this at least a, a month later. But food law, 
is, is I'm showing this because if we're keeping the Torah, this is one of the things that you can you need to change pronto. The the most prominent things is pork. Good gracious, and you got to look into your food ingredients. There's a I mean, man, I'm gonna go over all of this in the food law um, study, but pork is in everything, everything for a reason from marshmallows to capsules that you take for vitamins. It's, it's in everything. You really have to watch out. It's not just bacon on your plate. Um, so like I said, we'll get to that. But it also in the seafood, uh, shrimp, uh, lobster, crab, all those are unclean. So those are the prominent ones is pork, any type of pork, and the seafood is the ones that people eat on the regular that they need to correct immediately. And like I said, the, the commandments are not grievous. They're, they're very straightforward. You can, and you will, if you choose to not eat pork, you do not have to eat pork. That's not hard. And I found some beef bacon that won't have you missing any pork that I'll show you in my food law uh, study later on. Apocrypha books. I want to say this. Do not... Look into any apocrypha books if you do not have any ground foundation uh, on the Bible. I don't know how many people, and I say this with love, and I mean it because it is not good for someone vainly seeking wisdom with no foundation of truth. If you just got into truth, then why are you looking at it books that you ain't even, you're looking at apocrypha books and you ain't even read the Bible. Come on, family. There's an order of everything. I just told you the whole foundation is Torah. Go read the Torah before you go into apocryphal books. And another thing about apocryphal books. Um, I will say this. I'm going to recommend the, the Sefer. Not because of the translation. Uh, not The translation ain't nothing great. But I will give credit when credit is due. When, uh, so if you want to say, so the books that it just, I, I would recommend that's Apocrypha because there's a bunch of books out there, family. If we, you, you, you got to be honest with yourself. If you're not someone that is, can look into a, a Bible and break down scripture and, and, and put together studies and stuff like that and know that you're, this, this is truth and et cetera, et cetera then don't go into a bunch of books that is that is not ever talked about. Like, uh, for example, the book, I forget what it is, it's called the Book of the Nasarim or something. A book that is in, in a, any ancient apocrypha, any ancient collections to be scripture, that book is over there promoting sorcery. Everyone just wants to be so smart, they want to read books that no one's read before. And guess what you end up doing? You're in, you end up blaspheming the Ruach by pushing, pushing false doctrine books on people because you're just trying to be smart. Don't do that. But, uh, but yeah, um, I would say look up the Sefer books. They did do a great job. And look up the look up the sefer and look up. Not saying you have to buy the sefer, but if you want to know a book of collection of apocrypha that I recommend, they did a great job picking their apocrypha books. I I agree with every book that they have in the sefer. And uh, just to open it up, to give a quick quick uh, yeah, you see, I don't know if it's gonna be nah. Not even worth it. Can't see. But from 2nd Ezra's, things that was in a, a KJV 1611, the original Apocrypha, all, all solid books that is credible. Maccabees, 2nd uh, Baruch, uh, Jasher, Jubilees, Enoch, just the first book of Enoch, because there's a second and third book. Those books was written by Masons, 100%. It's not scripture. You see how easy it is? They can call, they can write a book and say, this is uh, the second book of Enoch. And if you're unlearned, you'll be like, great, I'm smart. I'm learning Freemason idolatry, traditions of man. 
So stick in your stick in your level and don't try to do too much. Don't not try to do too much. There's a lot of uh, I guarantee just the books that are, that is in the Sefer, um, with the entire canon. Reading all of that, it will take you like probably like three plus years to just read through that. So start with that. Don't go try to read the essence of whatever and the Nazarene of whatever. Just stick with that. It's going to take you long enough to read and to come to an understanding on these books. Trust me, there's enough wisdom right there. You do not have to go outside of all of that and try to be someone that found understanding that no one else has found. You got to do all that. But I also want to say that how do we confirm that books that books are scripture? For example, Gad the Seer. This is not in the Sefer, and I recommend this on one of my studies, and I actually have a study on it. And how do we know certain books are scripture? Well, when you have studied and now you have come understanding it, you have read enough scripture, when you read another book, it's going to read like that. It's going to read like all the books that you've read in the canon or in other uh, trusted apocrypha books. It should read very similar. It should quote scripture from the Bible because scripture, the Ruach, is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It's going to sound the same in all the books, just in different writings. So when you're reading it, well, uh, uh, when you start reading Apocrypha, a lot of Christians deny it because they don't sound like scripture to them because it's pushing Torah. But that's because they don't even follow the Old Testament. But when you read the entire canon and then you read the uh, Apocrypha and then you get a foundation, you can start seeing how books aren't scripture that people are saying is scripture because you have a foundation of understanding because the Bible, oh yeah, like Gad the Seer, what I was saying. Because another thing is that the Bible, um, like the uh, multiple times, the Bible says, as it is written in uh, the book of Jasher, it straight up tells you that there is a book of Jasher that a story is found in the book of Jasher that is uh, given confirmation to a story in the Bible. The same thing is in Enoch. Uh, Messiah quotes from Enoch. So the, 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 in other words, scripture quotes from scripture and so on. That's how all scripture works. They quote each other, they support each other, and they sound similar. That's how you know. And, and let me say this, just being straightforward, not everyone is given that gift of the Ruach to know that. I really do feel like some people really try to overstep their boundaries because they just want to be smarter than they are and it and instead of searching the the wisdom that is in scripture how many times do we read the bible and we've read something before and then you read it again and then you read something in a new light and you come to a new understanding my point is just because you read something one time don't mean you know anything study it don't read something one time and be like, okay, I'm ready to go search and read random books that who knows what, who wrote, who wrote what, okay? Yes, vain wisdom. Like, I mean, people just want to be smart for, I mean, that's what Freemasonry is, though. People that uh, want to be wise instead of uh, righteous. That's why there's so many books out here. That's why there's uh, religion, uh, Gnostic religion about searching wisdom instead of searching out righteousness all right i'm way behind on the uh on the messages so i have to keep going i can't keep up with everybody y'all blowing it up i love the fellowship but I'm just going to keep rolling. Um, we're, we're at the back end of this. I just want to say my little piece on a few stuff. Um, and this is what I was saying. This is a visual of cross-referencing. This is just in the canon of the illustration in Isaiah 28, 9 and 10. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. 
For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. That's how all scripture works. And this continues into the Apocrypha. This continues how they connect. They either quote each other or they they um they they point you in the direction, like it says in uh was it First Samuel? It literally says as it is written in Gad the seer. So it's telling you that there is a writing from the prophet of Gad that is written to give more explanation of that story. So this is how scripture works. Like I said. The, that book of Essence or the Not Serene uh, or other books that people, there is no connections, none. No, nobody quote from those books. And those books do not rightfully quote from the Bible. It don't even sound like scripture. Of course, it could say some good stuff like you are a light, shine your light. Gosh, guys, is it that easy? Just, they, they don't, don't listen to things that make your ears tingle. That's easy, family. There is scripture and there's things that just sounds good. The devil is good at what he does, all right? Let's put some respect on that. All right, all right. Yeah, I already went, oh, oh, recommended books. So this is, this is actually um, outside of the, uh, so this is just a starter pack. I'm not going into my entire bookcase. <laughs> I am going into uh, what I would recommend, starter pack. Like I said, I give credit when credit's due. I am not crazy about the Sefer translation, but the book collection is the best bar none. This is a expensive book. I think they're doing everyone a disservice of doing that, but to each its own. But the Sefer, just because in a nutshell, it gives you all the books. And like I said, the translation, they have a bunch of Hebrew words. It can be hard to read. I will give a warning for that. The only reason I say the Sefer is because of the Apocrypha. But if you don't want the Sefer, you can Google the Apocrypha books in Amazon, and there is plenty of choices on Amazon if you just uh, put apocryphal books. And, um, and like I said, align them up with the books that I like. Look up the uh, Sefer's collection of books, you know, just look it up and then search for a collection of that. You could find a couple of books that will meet that. That's much better. And I will recommend R.H. Charles translation for apocryphal books. That's just my recommendation. Yes. In the Sephir app, I will get to that, Bev. I will get to that in a second. So, uh, yes, I was going to uh, let me just say it now. The Sephir app is the best event, invest, uh, ad, investment with the Sephir. I would actually recommend the Sephir app over getting the Sephir book because it helps you understand it more and actually shows you what the word means. This is hard to read. I'm just letting y'all know. It really is. The Septuagint. The Septuagint is an older translation to help you get precepts and fact check verses. Um, it's just it's just that it's uh it's another study tool. I don't read from this all the time, but when I do deep studies and I'm looking for deep meanings and uh, I want to fact check certain things, like oh this verse is very important. I can open up the Septuagint and see what the Septuagint says if I can find a deeper meaning because it's in a different context because it's older, which means it has been touched by less hands as earlier stated. And the Aramaic Targum. And make sure you get... The pseudo Jonathan, they're not all the same. There is different Aramaic manuscripts out there. Get the Jonathan. And all of these books I'm giving y'all is not perfect. That's why we're using all of them. Because if there was one that was perfect, you could throw away all the rest, right? All of these is supposed to help us gather understanding in its entirety. But Targum, pseudo Jonathan. 
if you get another one, like many of us have, because I actually got the wrong one in the beginning as well, then you're just going to be stuck with the wrong one. This is the one to get. All right. When you have not studied the Torah yet, and let's say it's going to take a long time to read through the first five books of the Bible. Well, here's a little cheat code in the study is to get this from Hallelujah Scriptures. This is a great study tool because they break down all the commandments that we talked about in the beginning of this study. They break it all down, uh, all the 613 commandments of the Torah. They break it all down for you word, uh, piece by piece. They'll say the commandment and then they'll give you the verse. And so you could read each one and whatever abides to you, make lifestyle adjustments to honor his commandments. Once again, just look up Hallelujah Scripture and uh, go and search the website for the Torah of uh, Tetragrammaton, which that's all another story. <laughs> and last but not least, we want to try to get things as paperback because we don't know if we're going to have the internet forever, right? So I'm going to show you some things, like I was going to say the Sephra app, I'm going to show you some things that... Um, you could do online, but we want to make sure we have paperback for like definitions. So I also recommend the Compact Bible Dictionary. And uh, so if we don't have the internet to look up on Blue Letter Bible and other websites, you have a dictionary that can help you break down understanding of certain words that can be outside of your comprehension at the time. So once again, I recommend this and all of these except the Sefer. It may be Septuagint. Um, you can get all of these on Amazon. I got my Septuagint from eBay. Um, in the Sefer, you get it from their, their, they have their own website. So that's my starter pack that I would recommend. All right. Yes, yeah, a strong concordance. Um, I actually have my big book in there. You can get one of those as well. But like I said in the beginning, that could be a lot, a lot for folks. but. That's why I said beginning starter pack, because the study can just keep going on and on and expand it. And it gets, and it, like I said, if I give someone an interlinear or a strong accordance and they just got into the tour, they're going to look at me like I'm crazy. They're going to be like, what in the world is this? So, like I said, I ain't showing my whole bookshelf, but we can go on for days with recommendations. There's a lot of good stuff out there. But yes, absolutely. When you get into the Hebrew or the the Greek or um, I'm trying to think what's the what's the New Testament written in in most translations? Um, I don't know. I don't want to brain. Uh, whichever. When you get into the actual language that is uh, it being translated from into English, the the word uh, Aramaic. Thank you. The word or yeah and or Latin because those come from Latin. So. Those words have more meaning than the words that we begin in, in English. If you have not heard, English is the worst language that has ever been created, okay? So don't ever trust English, ever trust English. If you're doing deep research, it's not like you're just reading chapters. If you're doing deep research, you need to fact check English translations, and I'm about to show you an example why. All right. The Sephra app. Um, I wanted to show you that the Sephra app is cool because you can search. When I study, this is one of my secrets, putting together good studies and finding certain thing, uh, uh, topic. I, um, I go to the Sephra app and I can switch my book. I want to look through. So if I just want to look through the book of Romans, I can put in a key term and search it, or I can look through all the books, and that's the cool thing about the Sefer, is that it's all the books, not just the canon, but the, the Apocrypha for a topic, and then, um, and this is, so this is what I recommend over, um, this is what I recommend over actually buying the Sefer book, because buying the Sefer book is, especially for those that just started getting into the Torah and looking at Hebrew terminology, that thing is hard to read, but the apart of it, the Sefer app is excellent. Give credit when credit's due. This it costs money, but this is a must. The Sefer app is a must for 
those that are true students of the word. Not only can you search topics, you can, um, the words that is in Hebrew, like right here, they have Elohim. You can click that word and it actually tells you what Elohim means because that's the English word, I mean, that's a Hebrew word um, for the word of, that means God or the most high God or God's plural. Um, so it just, it's easier to read and it gives you more tools to understand what you're reading. So this is what I recommend. So if, if, if anything, you can get all of this paperback in the Sefer because the Sefer is expensive. It's over a hundred dollars. So you can get this Sefer app for like, I don't know if it's like, I think it's like 20 bucks and then get all of that, uh, paperback, but whichever, if you, if you got the money, buy it all, I, I, I get it, everything I can on paperback. And so now blue letter Bible tutorial, real quick tutorial. Let's click this real quick. So what I just say, uh, English is cursed and the translators ain't no better. So uh, I type in Easter. We know Easter is pagan. I told you Easter is pagan. So why is it in the Bible? You have legit pastors in churches telling you it's in the Bible for a reason. That is blasphemy. Study to show thyself approved. Um, why is the names and terms different than the Sefer? Uh, look at this study. Set apart names right here if you want more understanding on that. There, there, the this this walk is the deepest thing you ain't never you have ever been in in your life. I'll just say that much. When I first got into the truth, this truth, I thought once we started keeping Torah, it was like, oh, this is great. Until you realize there's a thousand different Torahs out there. There's a thousand different doctrines, names. In other words, you have to study everything like your life depends on it. And I mean it. It's that deep. It really is that deep. All right, continuing. Oh, Blue Letter Bible tutorial. So this is what I'm going to show you. So I'm a Blue Letter Bible. You can search at the top. I, I typed in Easter. And so um, looking at, this is how you look into uh, just a real basic tutorial and how to look at this. And I'm like, well, someone will come to me, which they have. Rob, you said Easter is pagan. Well, why is it in the Bible? Well, let me show you that it's not actually in the Bible. This is a bad translation. Um, and, um, uh, this is English. Like I said, you never trust English. You go to tools right here. You go to interlinear and then I, I put it reverse and, uh, it right here on the, it says the, uh, the English word that they, they translate it from the Hebrew word or the Aramaic, uh, depending on older or new Testament. And so you go down to the word. And this can do for any word. You can say, well, what does prison mean? What does that mean? The actual meaning of this in Hebrew. You can click on it to show you can be with anything. If you want more understanding and be like, okay, how is it used? It can be also mean to guard and watch, not just imprisonment. That's interesting. The same Hebrew word or, or uh, Aramaic word can be used differently. You see that? Watch and imprisonment are two different words in English. So context is key. So continuing though, the focus right here is Easter. How is this in the Bible? We go to, we click the Strong's word of this Hebrew word of how they got Easter. And it goes to Pesach. We go to Pesach and it says that this is the, the Pesach feast, which is Pesach is Hebrew for Passover. So it's not actually saying Easter. That's why 28 times it says it's translated as Passover. And only one time it's translated as Easter. This is what we call deception, ladies and gentlemen. This is Hasatan in plain sight. They put this at least one time to validate paganism. And this is what all the pastors and churches run to, right here. But we see right here that this word is actually Passover. But even in the definition, this definition is a summary written by man. 
You see how it says the Passover, but then they still put Easter? That shows you that nothing is perfect. Nothing is perfect. I had someone, for example, let me, let's go to something else. Let's go to a simple word like man. Oh, Adam, I mean, let's go to Adam. Adam, the name of Adam means man or mankind. But when we go to, or uh, even Ruddy, but Ruddy, why is his name mean Ruddy? Because he comes from the earth. Man comes from the earth. Man is dust of the earth. That's why it's Ruddy right there. But it means mankind. But when you see right here, it says human being. If you actually look up the etymology of human being, it's it, it comes from uh, homo sapiens. Homo sapiens is a word that means man that comes from apes. So right there, this is a bad translate, I mean, bad word to use in definition. Human being is a new word. The correct definition is man or mankind or dust of the earth. Human being, we are not human beings. Adam does not mean human being. It means man. So we have to understand that none of this stuff is perfect. That's why we have to keep studying. But when something doesn't sound right, look into it. You might be right that something like that is off because that's very possible. But that's just a basic way to double check. And, um, you know, I mean, you see how deep this is. There's deception at every corner. Every single corner, there's deception. And last but not least, if you are keeping the Torah and all the Bible, the Bible is a flat earth book, family. So many people, when they get into Torah and the truth, they don't know what's about to slap them, that they're going to about to become a flat earther if you're a true believer. This is what I'm ending on. The Bible is a flat earth book. And here is 200 verses. It's kind of hard to read. You can't Google this and look at images. You can find these verses. Um, and I also actually have a Flat Earth series on my YouTube as well. Um, I don't have right here. Flat Earth is biblical, or I should have said scriptural, but either way. Um, that's what I'm going to end on, family. And um, I know, right? The, the, the Flat Earth is way cooler than a heliocentric model. Uh, and that's another way. Remember I said, don't put no other gods before me. Or I didn't say the Bible said the first of the Ten Commandments. Uh, do you know believing in the heliocentric model is sun worship? The whole world worship, uh, orbiting around the sun and the sun deity is Apollo, which is why uh, NASA calls their missions Apollo this, Apollo 13, Apollo that, because they're sun worshipers. So, I mean, it's a, a lot of ways to worship deities. Um, so we have to watch out. So I pray that this study has been a blessing for you. This was Intro to the Torah. And uh, if y'all have any questions, feel free to follow me on Instagram. Instagram is my main source of communication with uh, those in the fellowship. Uh, my DMs are always open. I have people email me. But I'm telling you, if you email me, it will be delayed. I am not look good at checking my emails because I'm busy doing a lot of other stuff and I'm not good on emails. Uh, but I will check them and I will get back to you if that's your source. I'm looking at this on YouTube if you don't have IG. But if you do, contact me on IG about any of these questions. I have a ton more uh, short videos on all these topics. Um, just reach out to me and I for sure will connect the dots if you have any other questions. But um, thank y'all for the fellowship. It's Shabbat. Shalom. Yasharallah.